<laughs> Welcome. Welcome to this program, another in a series of programs that we are continuing to do with the Dummerston Conservation Commission. And um, we have a strong commitment to educating everybody as much as we possibly can about uh, our nat the natural resources of the area. And we have some really good people that um, to, to do these kinds of presentations. And so um, if you can help us out by making a donation, there's a donation jar up there. That'd be great. Uh, I want you to meet Lynn Levine. And she's going to speak for herself and tell us who she is and what she does. And I think we'd be really thrilled that you came. Well, thanks for coming. And it's so great that um, Casey Morrow at the Collaborative lets us use this space. I mean, it's such a great space. <clears throat> but I don't have any PowerPoint. Good. Everything is hands-on. So, but you so you can look at the blank board. <laughs> <laughs> That's about it. Um, so there was an article in the paper about talking about my new book and me, and it said in the article somewhere that I'd been here for 40 years. And I, that was the most shocking thing about the article. It was like, oh my God, I've been here for 40 years? It was very exciting at the same time. <laughs> but that's the case. So, and then the, the great story happened the other day, which was I was taking, I'll give you a background in a second, but it's fun to tell stories. So I'm a forester, and I was working in the woods taking notes, because I go out and take all this data, and I'm sitting there very silently, Although, I make a lot of noise in the woods, so I, I don't know. So anyhow, I was just taking my data and looking around in this. This is just, this is just three days ago. And um, I look over, and there's a fisher. It was literally right here. And I was a little surprised. <laughs> it was a small fisher. Everyone says, is that a big fisher? Well, no, this is a small fisher. <laughs> it was new fur. And, um, and he did what you're supposed, exactly what you're supposed to do, which is what? Freeze. Freeze. Exactly. And that's exactly what I did. I just went. <laughs> <laughs> and then it finally looked back at me. I mean, it had been looking back at me, but then finally said, I guess there's no any reason to hang out around here. It just went off. And so, um, anyone know how a, a fisher moves? Exactly. Exactly. So that's what it did. It just went and went off. And I was, went on and I took the next plot. <laughs> and then the week before that, I know everyone has their stories, but I'll just tell my other one since I have the chance to do that. I said I was going to somebody's woodland and I was in Marlboro, and I'm on back roads usually. I know I, I have my GPS, so I do know where I am. <clears throat> and I look up on this one of the Auger Hole Road. Hi. Uh, and um, there, staring in front of me, was the largest animal I had ever seen in New England, which was a moose. Exactly. A score. <laughs> and it was really, it was so big. It was just, I'd seen, yeah, I'm not supposed to do that, am I? <laughs> um, I'd seen uh, moose at a distance, but you know, the, at that, the, I was as far away as that black chair over there, and it stared at me, and I stared at it, and it stared at me, and I stared, and it was, was Incredible, so I shouldn't stare at it because it was a him <clears throat> with incredible rack. And then it went off up somebody's driveway. And then it was gone. And I knew, don't follow it, Lynn. I know you want to see more, but just don't follow it. So I did. <clears throat> Would have been a really dumb thing to do. <clears throat> I thought about it really for only like a quarter of a second. Um, so I became a forester um, 36 years ago, and some people have heard my story just a few times, like Betsy, in her classroom. <laughs> but um, I grew up in Brooklyn. 
And so my mother would always say to me, like, what? How did you get to do this? I don't get it. <clears throat> In fact, one of my clients um, would call me um, Al Sandry, who owned Sandry Oil Company. He was one of my clients in Massachusetts, and he'd go, he'd call me Brooklynese. He was like, Brooklynese! Anyhow, so I got to, to Brattleboro before I became a forester from, obviously, from Brooklyn. I had no idea there was such a thing as a forester. But I wanted to move away from the city, and I worked for the Environmental Defense Fund, and I wanted to leave the city. Uh, and so I was trained as a school teacher, but I didn't want to do that anymore. So I took a map of Vermont, and I had gone skiing in southern Vermont, so I knew I liked Vermont, but I didn't know a lot about it. So I took this map of New England, and I went, and that was Brattleboro. Mm -hmm. So I took a train up to Brattleboro, mm -hmm. and when I got to Springfield, at that point, the, the <coughs> chain, it changed. You know, you got off and to another bus, and so I thought I arrived when I got to Springfield, Massachusetts. And I was like, oh my god, this is really terrible. <laughs> and then, then the bus driver said, no, keep on going. And so I ended up in Brattleboro. And um, people, I mean, I immediately met people and they took me in. And so I decided to move here. And the, well, the other thing that happened when I moved here was I looked up at the mountain that I thought was in Vermont. <laughs> which was one tastic it and went oh my god I can't wait to leave I'm going to do that twice oh my god um, I'm home I felt like Heidi and I'd come home so so I stayed um, and that's sort of and then became a forester and that's a long story but how I became a tracker from being a forester was that I had been a forester, and when you're a forester, what you do is you're trained to look up at the trees. So I'm walking around for years like this. Wow, is that tree healthy? Mm. What's going on up here? And then at some point, I know I looked at my feet every once in a while, but well, at some point I looked down and it was snow on the ground and I was with a logger trapper, Ed Melchin, and I said, I saw two tracks side by side, and it was so clear, the tracks. I had no idea what it was. So I said, Ed, what is it? And he said, a fisher. Mm -hmm. And I was like, how did he know that? So I figured if he could know that, I could know that too. So that's what started my search for learning about tracking. And I just love being able to, um, it's a mystery. How many of you like to track? Perfect. OK, so why do you track? <laughs> Anyone want to tell me why they track? Go ahead. To well, I like to know what visits my garden. I'm sorry. Yeah. Oh, visits your garden, yes. Yeah. To share it with the kids and because it's interesting. Yeah, and what, what's interesting about it? It's like there's history on the ground. Yeah, yeah. great. So it tells a story. Yeah. And I like to know that there's wild creatures all around even though we can't see them. That's what I like to know for sure. Because mo although I told you the two stories, I barely see animals in the woods. So being able to go and track bear and, and know that they're here and moose and that is more common than actually seeing them. And at some point, um, I, in fact, in this place right here, uh, Martha and I were taught, were hired to teach tracking. We got a small grant, no, to teach observation skills to teachers. So we, we created this little booklet that had moose tracks and deer tracks and and they were the the life size and when we brought it to the teachers and put it on the ground and they could see the deer versus the moose track they went nuts and they went 
you have to make a book. And so we decided after that that it was such a good idea that it took two years and we made our first book, which is here. For those of you who haven't seen us. Um, and then, uh, which now has sold 13,000 copies. <clears throat> and uh, how this book works just is that you can see the patterns of the animals that they move, and I'll show you a little bit more later. And then it goes through a key based on, on that, <clears throat> on how they move. Um, so the new book that just came out. So I sometimes have good ideas when I'm taking a bath. <laughs> No, no, that. <laughs> Yours is showers? Yes, absolutely. When I'm stuck, I go to the shower. It, it, it works? 30, 40 years. Yeah, That's, great. That's great. That's great. So. Yeah. Um, so you were listening to that, though? No. It could have, though, because it's water. It could, yes. I was going to say. It is possible. It is possible. <laughs> um, but what, I'll, I'll go through it and teach you how, how this book works. Um, uh, so I'll go through that. It did take us three years. Well, Cliff, my husband, edited everything that comes out. So, And he was teaching school, and he didn't have a lot of time. So I would get 45 minutes a week some weeks, and I would just cry, like, I want this book to come out sooner. <clears throat> so to begin with, page one. So, the, so this is the book is waterproof. The tracks and scat are life size. And um, it has a very specific order to the whole thing. The, be the beginning of the book are the tracks, and then when you get to the red page, is the scat key at the end. So we have that's page 28. So we have tracks in the front and scat in the back. <clears throat> how this tracking book is really follows how I think as a tracker. And the, um, when I find a track that's really clear, then I study the track. And when I find a track that's not really clear and there's a pattern, then I follow the pattern. And I always say, any one track looks like all other tracks or patterns, so you've got to really follow it out when you're just following the pattern. Um, that makes sense? Good. Okay. So, um, so it starts off that this is all about a clear track to begin with. And the measurements here on here are the size of the hind tracks, and they're when they're about the right size. Um, in other words, if you squish or it's old, it's going to get bigger. You know, so some, that's why everyone knows they've seen a mountain lion because the bobcat track just gets a little bit bigger too. So it kind of gets confusing. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Okay. So the I found out at a tracking workshop on Saturday that what I created was a new algorithm. Which I like the word, so I'm <laughs> it sounds pretty sophisticated, doesn't it? <laughs> so how it works is that well, if you find a clear track, it's you, this is divided up into those that are about the same size, the front and the back, and those that are not the same size. It's, and that's one of the basic systems of thinking in terms of how to identify a track. Um, uh, so, if we turn to page four, we could look at all the tracks that are the same size. And I'll go through them with you. And, and then there are clues underneath. So the first one that we're going to look at are those that have four toes with an X in it. Can you see the picture of an X on there? 
So that's what it means by that it has an X in it. It goes through the pad itself. Correct. So this pad here, anyone guess what this bushy tail it has an X, has four toes. I like a fox. It, it's bigger than a fox, though. Coyote? Yes, exactly. So, <clears throat> and when, when you have it in your hands, you'll see that it has that cross and the four toes. You can feel it, so that's a good sense of it. And this bushy tail is the clue that it's a coyote, too. But it's the size of the foot, so. <clears throat> and I don't know about you, but if I know I've seen a coyote, if it's just yes. walking absolutely straight line and you can feel the energy of it um, and rather than a dog that's just moving here and there and everywhere. Yes? Isn't one of the clues to a coyote the way the tail hangs as well? It, it hangs more out at an angle than down? Uh, I never thought about it, but it makes sense. I mean, well, I heard that's how you could distinguish between a coyote and a fox, for instance. Um, well, or that would be one way. Their coloration is just oh, sure. so different that it would be hard to confuse them if you, in terms of that. But that's an interesting thought that it has to, you know, you're looking at the tail. So the coyote got here, the coyote in the East Coast is bigger than the coyote in the West Coast. Their story is they got here in the 60s or so around there is that the coyote, small coyote in the west went and mated with the red wolf and then procreated here and it was a coyote that um, <clears throat> it, was, it was now bigger than it was before. So we have this matching powder, and that's how they're bigger in the East Coast than the West Coast. Because everything else is bigger in the West Coast, right? So it's kind of unusual. So then we have... Um, I'm just guessing. If you're wrong, don't worry about it. I mean, because, you know, it's kind of fun that to just be guess. That a fox to me. Yeah, absolutely. And what it's... What uh, claws look like? Well, that's absolutely a good point. It has four toes and it has a cross in it. So we're in that first box. And it's not, it's, believe it or not, this is a gray fox. Gray fox, yeah. Yeah. Doesn't look gray. It doesn't look gray, does it? <clears throat> but in comparison to the red fox, it does look gray. <laughs> Very well said. Um, the gray fox is smaller than the red fox. And everyone thinks it's bigger, but I don't know why. But it, it's smaller. And uh, <laughs> um, if you just move it along a little bit quicker so everyone gets a chance, that would be great, April. <clears throat> this, the, the, the gray fox um, retract their claws so you don't when you see a track and it doesn't have claws and it has X and four toes then it's a gray fox because they climb trees gray fox climb trees did you know that you're looking really surprised yeah you can see they Scratch the tree for claws, and they need to keep them delicate, just like a cat. So what else do we have here? We have the toes for the red fox. But a red fox doesn't climb trees, does it? No. No, red fox does not. But red fox are so skinny that if you have um, a, okay, in a fence that, that's between me and Miller Road, there is, there is fence that's about this spaces between it, and there are fox tracks going to it, and then there were fox tracks on the other side. Oh. <laughs> no, it went through. Yeah. It, it's so not about, it's so skinny, really, and it's just all this fur mm -hmm. going on. 
Um, How do they judge the size that I can fit through? Is it like whisker diameter? Because even though its body may be small, its skull is still a certain... Right. So, I think so the skull they... is the determining. How do they know? Yeah. I bet it's trial and error. <laughs> <laughs> Oops, it didn't work that time. I, we, we have some sense of our bodies, so I assume that they have some sense of theirs. It's not like a whisker thing or anything. I don't know. It's a good question. That's why I teach, because I never thought about it. <laughs> is it a whisker thing? Is that how anyone know if they determine space by whiskers? No, I don't know. I don't know either. It's a good question. It is a good question. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I wanted to so um, buy this book, and so I'm going to take notes in it. So is that all right with you? As long as it's a waterproof pen. Yeah. If it's not, don't. It's going to run all over the place when I get out in the woods with it. All right. I'll meditate on that thought. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Very impressive. That's good how I sign books, otherwise I'll remember to give it back to right. you. Okay. John wants to say something. Here. Yes. Um, red foxes routinely den in woodchuck holes, which yes. are nine inches in diameter, roughly. So they know they can fit into a very small space. Perfect. Yeah, that's not uncommon then for them to find that space. Yeah. They, they also den in other weird lo locations. Are things going around fast enough so that people are seeing it? Yeah. No. Let's come into it. Let's speed it up <coughs> a little bit. See if we can move things quicker. Otherwise, by the time I talk about the beaver, you'll have barely seen the fox. OK, so um, I got. Where are the red fox feet? Did I still over there? No, that's gray. That's that's gray. Okay, did I actually pull out the red fox feet and I didn't know? Okay, I'll worry about it later. Here they are. So I'll pass these around. Um, so these are the red fox feet, which is harder to feel, but you can see see the nails sticking out, and if you try, you can then see the. Um, Feel the, the X. Okay. What we've done now is we've gone through in three minutes four toes with an X. So the next one are four toes without an X that don't have any claws. And in this case, what we have. This. What? What is this? Hmm? Oh, bobcat. Exactly. The little bobby tail out there. Oh, um, Beautiful. And you can feel this as it goes around. You can feel the four toes, and it's asymmetrical. So that means one toe sticks out longer than the other. And the other animal that I have, that's a cat that isn't in the book, Oh. Any guesses? Yes. Lynx. Exactly. How'd you know? What what made you think? Coloration. What was that? The coloration. The coloration. Great. And um, also the size of the foot. It's quite a lot bigger than the than the um, bobcat. <clears throat> why why do they have big feet? Snow. What? How does that help them? Yeah. Exactly. Otherwise, they're like they're. I think their, their pads are covered with fur, right? Exactly. Look. So they don't freeze. Yeah, that's right. It, that's, that's, yeah, someone said to me, wouldn't that get stuck in the snow or something? And they would lose some of the fur, but it actually keeps them warm, which is really good. Um, now, you're supposed to ask me if there are mountain lions. Because I've never are, done a workshop that someone hasn't asked me that. Lynn, are there mountain lions? Well, has anyone seen one is what I always say. No. Not today. Not today? <laughs> okay, then I could tell you <laughs> that there is no positive proof that there are mountain lions. There are definitely is not a breeding population of mountain lions. But people see them all the time. And the, one of the things I learned, for one, is that the, the data shows 
for whatever species of what people want to see, there are so many sightings, but the actual, actual sightings are, are really very small. And it turns out there's a trading route that goes through Vermont and New Hampshire. They have catamount game places that people hunt, and that there's some escapees. It's legal to have a game um, in, in Florida. So there might be one or two, you know, moving around, but there's no population of catamounts. God, you're an easy group. People get really angry at me if I say that. Yes, go ahead. Well, the other thing is that I appreciate is that you have the gray wolf in there. Ah. Something. They're not here, but they're, know, but, but, but yeah, exactly. And I do, if you come to my house, I have my gray wolf that's been like that big. It's incredible. So, is, is there links here? What? Are there links? In northern Vermont, there are links now, in Maine and in New Hampshire, but that's relatively new. So they're mainly in Canada. And I would love to track them. I almost went on a workshop. Um, yeah, Bob Etzweiler is leading a workshop at the Vermont Wilderness School in, the, I think, December, January. Aha, uh -huh, aha. Uh -huh. you, you track links? Is that what you said? That's what he, he's leading a workshop. I work with him at the Vermont Wilderness School, but he leads a, like, Oh, track great. Yeah, in northern Maine. That's People great. Go, so Me? Yeah. Okay, I'll find out more. Um, and then the same, when we keep on going down, Five toes without an X with claws. All of those are members of the weasel family. So what's in a weasel family? Or what, how would you describe what a weasel looks like? It's brown. Members of, exactly. And long. some of long, right? And <coughs> they have the same size feet in the front and the back. So what I do have the front and the back of a fisher. They're the same size? Well, that's really hard walking around there. So I'm sorry. I'm, I'm good OK, good. <laughs> um, and you can see the five toes and the claws. And that's a good example of an animal of the, of the fisher. And we, it is definitely not a fisher cat because fishers have nothing to do with cats. It's very confusing. I don't know, anyone guess why fisher cats are called fish, fishers are called fisher cats? They're the same size as cats? Maybe, though not the same shape, exactly, but maybe the same size, yeah. Maybe they can fit in small spaces like cats? Could be, yeah. And I think it has something to do with the face. But somehow it looks a little bit like a cat face, the fisher face. Do you think? Teeth. Yeah, I think that's why people say that. The and number of teeth? What was that? Um, what about the, the teeth? I mean, obviously the, the size are significantly larger, but the number or maybe the, the configuration of teeth? I don't think that they would be very similar. similar. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I think it's the facial structure, <coughs> is my guess. And then what we have here, yes? Well, exactly, I know about fishes is um, they also kill chickens. They do. <laughs> my, I know. My friend had a, something small and furry. She thought was a fisher that came in, and she's overprotective on her chickens, so she grabbed it and she swung it twice around her head and threw it in the woods. Wow! <laughs> Can you say that again? That's amazing well, story. She still doesn't know what it was, and it dropped from a tree and it landed near her. But she grabbed it and she swung it three times around her head and she pitched it with the door. But it never came back. <laughs> <laughs> well, my, my, I don't know. Beats my story. <laughs> I wasn't there then. No, no, I hear you. But my, um, my husband heard um, sounds outside of uh, of uh, yeah, like little s small sounds, and uh, he went outside to check, and there was a fawn and a fisher was on it, oh. and he threw rocks at the fisher, and then he carried the fawn into our house, and I'm yelling at him going, but that's okay that the fisher is getting the fawn, it's part of nature. 
as you can imagine. <laughs> Anyhow, so we held the fawn, and then we didn't know what to do. We saw the, 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 the mama going back and forth outside. Mm. And um, so we called the game warden. He said, what do we do? We have this fawn in our house, this fisher out there, and guess what the game warden said? Put the fawn back out there. <laughs> yes, exactly. And that's what we did. We put the fawn back out there. And we saw it. Well, we think we saw the fawn and the, and the mom lit, and a few days later, but who knows? It could have been another fawn. It's a good story to say that we do. So here was another animal that um, is the otter that has two feet oh, yes. that are the same in the back and the front that's in the weasel family. And I don't really have their feet, but this is a weasel tail that moves that oh. has front and back feet. Can't you tell by this that they have front and back feet the same? No? <laughs> Anyhow, it's kind of cute just to look at it. So, we've gone through... Oh, no, we didn't. We got the hoof. That kind of stands up. Front and back are about the same, all of these. They're not exactly the same. So in, in a dog family, the front are bigger than the back, but they're almost the same. So we have... A mountain lion? No. <laughs> hey, that is a, a moose. <laughs> exactly. Okay, so we have the moose and we have the deer. And um, just to make sure that you know, this is taxidermy. So these are behind. They're not laid out like this. And you can see the tracks. In the tracks, <coughs> what they're called dew claws that are back. And you can see that in the deer, too. Um, but it's pr pr significantly bigger, obviously, yeah. the two from each other. Um, I'll pass them around. Wow. So we just went through all the animals that feet are the same in the hind feet and the front feet. Now, I bet you don't have a lot of no notes because it says most of it there, doesn't it? Yeah. Yeah. But wow. I wanted to write down the stuff about the um, fox. That's great. So that was back before. That's great. So if we turn the page, and if you note, there's a symbol that it's the same size uh -huh. on the top, which helps you later on. <clears throat> now we turn to page five and six, and you can see the little symbol is that there's a back foot, a hind foot, and a front foot. I do not say back foot because sometimes the back foot isn't, the hind foot's in the front, so it doesn't make any sense. So it's a hind foot and the front foot. Isn't the hoofs? of moose and deer the same material as their fingernails? They're cartilage, yeah. Mm -hmm. And their antlers are completely different. Um, are their antlers bone? You know, I'm not sure exactly. I don't think so, but they're the fastest growing cells. I think there's some kind of cartilage in, in any cell. It's just that they grow from nothing to big in one year. Mm -hmm. So, pretty dramatic. So the first one, are all the four prints are together, and the back feet are bigger than the front feet. And one example I have of the ones that are a little bit bigger. Now, this is taxidermid, so it's shrunk quite a bit. Oh. But what we have is, anyone guess? Snowshoe hair? No. Snowshoe hair, exactly. <laughs> yeah. And this is the hind foot, and this is the front foot. And they push off with their back feet. So th this is, um, and when they land, they have all four together. This is, I'll just pass them out like this. They're kind of under Small. here. Snowshoe hair, you just, you don't find the snowshoe hair usually because they're very secretive. Yeah. But they leave their scat everywhere. <laughs> yeah. we talk about it a little bit. Depends on how far we get. Um, so the rest of this five and six are s the shape of that you might see. Besides the the first two are uh, somewhat the size or some of the pattern <coughs> that there are four together and also the shape. But when we get to G, we get to, to it looks like human hands, which is the raccoon. I think the possum looks more 
know, like, you know, like, you know. Yeah. Mm. Five toes. They're really good at what? Oh, that'd be Pokemon. Opening things. Close. This one's a raccoon. Oh, opening things. They're opening things. So it makes sense with these long fingers. Exactly. You got it. One bigger than the other. You got the hind foot and the front foot. Oh. How's the collection going? Pretty good. Oh, good. That's not bad. That's not bad. You guys are doing good. I'll be moving. Then we have, and everyone has raccoon stories, right? I don't. No, you don't have any raccoon stories? Well, they're really good at getting out of compost bin. And they climb trees, and I remember clearly when I was with, uh, I followed the tracks to a tree, and I was sure that it was raccoon that I had followed. This is probably 20 years ago. And I was with another, with a logger, Doug Waterman, and I was saying, so what is this? And I'm saying, it's sure it's a raccoon, and positive it's a raccoon. And then he goes, look up. I was like, oh, it's a por porcupine. <laughs> <laughs> um, the, they also cooperate. What? They also cooperate. If you go to a campground, yes. there are a lot of them, particularly if they're generations, and people put big rocks on top of a cooler, Yes. and they'll line up two or three of them, and they push back all at the same time, and they move huge rocks. Mm. You saw that in the Catskills. That's cool. Yeah, there was, there was like five generations, and they passed this knowledge on in the campground. So wow. everybody is told, forget you got to keep it in your car, because they will find a way to open. And it's true. It's move. true. And I saw at the tracking workshop I went to Saturday, someone had a camera, one of those cameras, mm. that um, they, put, they would put out to kill deer. Uh, that were hit, hit in a car accident and put them out and take all these different pictures and one of them were of raccoons and there were three of the raccoons eating together and the fourth one was asleep. Didn't wake up in time for dinner. Wasn't that raccoon you just saw that went by? It says it in the in the little containers. Yeah, what was that? Oh, that was the hair. Okay. Good. Sorry. Good, that's okay. I get it. So we have here something that. Dad's not sure he wants oh. I think it's the next one, right? Yeah. Possum? Yeah. yeah. Yep. They look, they look like human hands. They look at their thumbs. Yeah, they have thumbs. They have the opposable thumbs. So they're really good at opening up things, too. And somewhere here. Nope. Oh, here it is. This is their tail. No. And they're coming north. I know, it's kind of like, everyone says they look like a rat, right? Yeah, they're awful things. Okay. So, you know, they're, they're, but I have to say what's really neat about seeing an opossum and knowing that they're there is that their tracks are unbelievable. I mean, it's so amazing to see a track with this thumb. I think the wonderful thing about possums that I heard about yes. is that they eat thousands of ticks a day. That's oh, right. So <laughs> Yay! Uh, that's right. All right. <laughs> yes. Well, exactly. I know about uh, about opossums because they are called marsupials. You get it. Yeah. That's terrific. Yeah. Yes. Okay. We go from there to another animal that has Beaver. different hind foot and front. And Beaver. They're for treading water, right? The exactly, the yes. The so they have really um, webbed feet. Okay. And um, the, um, maybe in the end, I, I have recordings of all these animals, but the the when it's eating it goes 
It makes little sounds. <laughs> Is that pretty okay? Yeah, and funny. I hit my mic again. <laughs> it's okay. Okay. So, <laughs> um, but look how different the back foot and the front foot are. The hind foot and the front foot are. Okay. They look like two different animals. The they do. They do. They look really different. Let's see what I have left. Oh. Wow. Beaver tail. Beaver tail, exactly. Doesn't smell so good. I'm not going to pass on that. <laughs> I do need a muskrat. Oh. All right, keep me on the list. You never know what the, the, the people want. Okay, so then there's the woodchuck and the skunk, and then we get through. Oh, the bear. Yeah. Miss the bear. <clears throat> so this is the back foot of the bear, and this is, or the hind foot, and this is the front foot. Wow. And guess what? They're not from the same animal. Oh. Because the back foot is a lot bigger than the front foot, the hind foot. Okay. But you can see the claws. Yes. Are really, really sharp. So why do they need claws for? It's to escape bark. Yes, absolutely. So they can climb up the tree. Yeah. Yeah, and also it's very good if they're going after another animal. Reach outside their tail. Sure. What was that? They roll, over logs. they roll over. They scrape it to get the ants that are inside the logs. Or bees. Or bees, that's right. They go after bees. But they're not going after the honey. They're going after the bees. The insects. <laughs> Doesn't, don't they marsh territory by scratching as well? Yes. And they do that. And they also do, this is how they literally mark. They, they do this to mark. And they also go like, they bite into the tree. Uh -huh. Yeah. And that makes a mark. Uh -huh. And they're very, very community oriented. We Many of us heard... The, the wow. talk from Ben Killam, mm -hmm. um, but they're very social animals, and they do communicate with that way, not just to say, I'm here, don't come here, but I'm here, and, and you can come here too. So they're very social in that way. It's not just a territorial, don't come in here. Um, and now I've seen, from so from here, any of those, for the last one, for the, did I show the porcupine? How can I forget that? Oh my gosh. So this is the porcupine's sm small front and big hind foot. And they also have these amazing nails. Great to... I'll, I'll pass it. Okay, I'll answer your question right now. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, also for good for climbing trees. <clears throat> And they're really, they're, they're great to track. They're so much fun to track because they go back to the same spot all over and over again. And so they have, know where to find them. yes, and you can track them over and over again and they go from one spot where they have their poop and mm -hmm. to another, you can find their poop and then you can go to another spot in, in usually in rock formations. That is really quite common that that there are. My best story Whoa. is of teaching in a school nearby and the teacher saying to me, um, well, you take the kids and I just need a rest. So <laughs> that wasn't me. It, I promise. <laughs> Never. <laughs> and <clears throat> And so I took all the kids up the hill. And of course, I didn't know any of their names or anything. So some of the kids, you know, there's always kids that want to run in front of you, and you can't go, come on back, because you don't know their names. And then <clears throat> there's always kids that are going much slower. So it's just a very interesting experience. And we get to the top, and there's a stone wall. And inside the stone wall is a porcupine. <laughs> so my story is that half of the kids 
tried to climb trees to get out of the way, and the other half were looking for rocks to kill it. <laughs> it was just an exciting moment of learning never to go out with a teacher that's not going to be there with you. Um, I think I've now just covered all of the ones that don't. So what I was trying to say before is, if you, if you see Porcupine, page 24, then you can skip to page 24 and see the life-size picture of the porcupine. And if you're at page 24, because what you really like to do as a, is just kind of flip through things. Some people just like to flip and match. So if you do that and you're on page 24, and <clears throat> then you can go back. It gives you some clues, like there's a long inward pointing toe marks, and it gets you back to the key on page six. So it goes forwards and backwards. And if you don't have any clear tracks, then we, we're talking about patterns. So those are on page seven and eight. It's really exciting, as I was saying, to follow the pattern um, and find out what the animal is doing. I, I'm going to be leading some workshops this winter again, and uh, to this great spot that is in Dummerston, um, um, that it comes down off the of Black Mountain, and just incredible wildlife there. So the first one of the group are the walkers. And they're in a straight line. So does anyone want to help me be a walker? No. Come on down. I know I get you. So what we do as walkers is that we move that and then our other side. Yeah. And then you move this one and then you move this one. That's great. That's what you did when you were crawling. You just did it a lot faster. <laughs> Thank you. Just went backwards. <laughs> <laughs> so it's diagonal moving pattern, and uh, so it's one side and then the other. Not one side, but a, a diagonal and then the other side. And what you're seeing in those tracks, those tracks that you're looking at, are only the back tracks because the back foot is going right where the front foot were. Uh -huh. So if you watch... Yeah. Goes right in. <clears throat> so when you think you're looking at something different than it actually is, so you're seeing the back foot, which is smaller than the front foot. <coughs> the next group so next to that is all the straddles, which are, is the width of the pattern. Mm -hmm. If you go back to page, um, I think it's page three, there's a picture of straddle. So it's the outside width to the outside width on the bottom of page three. Mm. Okay. The bigger, within a group of movement patterns, the bigger the animal is, the bigger the straddle is. So what I have here is the average straddle on seven and eight, and it just increases in size from the left to the right. Um, so we have the smallest are the gray fox and red fox, and the biggest are the gray fox, wolf and mountain lion. That's the walkers. Mm -hmm. Then we have the bounders. We talked to, remember that fissure that I said that I saw and it was bounding? So you can imagine what this fissure is doing or any of the members of the weasel family is that this is one, the, this is the hind feet and this is the front feet. So you have to do this imaginary with me. It's like a slinky. It's really long. What's going to happen is the back is going to curve up. 
Did you see it in your mind's eye? Oh, yeah. Yeah? And what you're seeing in those tracks are only the back feet again. Mm -hmm. So if they go like this, the legs will come up and land. Yeah. You want to try it? Come on down. So you push off. Well, actually, you're going to stretch out with your whole body. And then, yes, oh, yes perfect. perfect. <laughs> that's exactly it. Yes, that's how the bounder moves. Perfect. Um, questions about that? Uh, you say sometimes three tracks? Sometimes, yeah. S sometimes there's three and sometimes there's even four. That's why you want to keep on tracking, following the pattern to see mm -hmm. if you can find the typical pattern. Sometimes it'll be three. And to be, and also, it's because a fisher and weasel and all of these actually walk too when they're going slower, but their normal gait mm -hmm. is the two by two. So most of the mammals can move other ways, but this is the typical least energy mm -hmm. use of their body. Then we have the hoppers. So this one's the confusing one because the hind feet land in front of the front feet. Okay? So I definitely need your help on this one. <laughs> so that explains page five when it shows um, the F, the, the yes. cotton, cotton tail rabbit of the, the snowshoe hair. And the mouse and the shrew and all of those in the oh. group above it. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So, what's going to happen is, if this is my back feet, and they're big, and I jump out, and my feet come around, mm -hmm. but I'm pushing off with my back feet. Yeah, perfect. Yeah. That's great. So the front feet are in the back. Questions about that? No? None. Okay. So. Advanced group. What? We're an advanced group. You are so good. And again, the 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 tracks. Um, one of the differences between the small tracks and the bigger tracks is that the bigger the the snowshoe hare and the cottontail, their the, their smaller feet are at a diagonal. Versus the other rodents and. <clears throat> Are, and the shoe isn't a rodent, but it's in there, uh, are uh, horizontal. So that's the difference between the two. And then we have the waddlers. I don't know your first name. I should know. Tara. Tara. Okay, so Tara is going to help me again, right? Oh, no problem. <laughs> so <laughs> what is she going to make me do this time, right? <laughs> So waddlers, this one's easy. They move one side of their body and then move the other side. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Excellent. <laughs> yeah, you got it. You caught on. Perfect. And they can do it really fast, too. It's not that it's a slow motion. <coughs> but imagine in the zoo or where you see pictures of a bear. You remember to see the spine kind of rotates like that? Mm -hmm. That's what's happening. Mm -hmm. And the other way I think of it is it's about eight months of pregnancy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> You're just shifting your body one side. <laughs> Most of the animals make that movement. You can see they're the biggest group. Um, and they're, they, <clears throat> they're just, it's an easy move to make. Um, so that's the, that's the whole thing about tracking. And then I can switch to scat. So this is my scat collection. I've only brought part of it. So it's not great to pick up scat with your hands, is the first thing, unless you have some plastic gloves on or something. Because some of them are not healthy, like raccoon. It's actually dangerous. Because <clears throat> they have a virus, it comes off the 
So how this world of scat is divided, according to Lindley, is that um, there's spheres and then there's cylinders. And spheres aren't necessarily just spheres, but they can just be a little bit elongated. And then there's cylinders that are much longer. So, for example, here are, wait, let's see, I do have a, this is a sphere. Oh, yeah. Um, it, this is too round to be a deer, but I'll show you. Here's what a deer looks like versus, I'll pass them out together. So the snowshoe hare and the cottontail rabbit are, have the same, are, are, the, are round, and they tend to have wood in them, especially if it's a snowshoe hare. I think it, it, it is like, a rabbit. I, so they've been carefully preserved. No, I was just remembering a prank my friend played on me. I had a pet rabbit. Did and, you? Yes. And what happened? What's uh, the prank? She rolled up um, wax, and white wax, and yes. I got very nervous. I thought something was wrong with the rabbit. Oh! <laughs> she rolled up little white. Fair. Yeah. Not fair. <laughs> it's a not prank fair. <laughs> Not fair, right? No, that's not fair at all. Okay. Here's here's a rabbit that's a little bit bigger. This oh. is from out west. This is an antelope jackrabbit. Mm -hmm. And my joke is that I collected this and I was sure they were going to find it in my suitcase and arrest me <laughs> <laughs> for having scat. <laughs> what did I have in there? Um, and so now we have the little bit elongated, small elongated. No, actually, these aren't small. These are um, large elongated. And we have the deer and of all different sizes and the moose. So, How do you preserve it? Um, well, Cliff, my husband, I bring him home, and he, we dry him up for a little bit, and then we take clear uh, spray. And we do it over and I don't do it. He does it over and over and over again. Acrylic um, spray. And it, it makes a hard. An acrylic spray? It's an acrylic spray. Yeah, exactly. And you can get it at the hardware store. But it's loose poop? Yeah. It's, it's a lot smaller than I thought it would be. I know, because why do you think it might be larger than you think? You mean, why do you think it's smaller than you think? No, no. It could be larger than you think right now. But you thought it was smaller, but it could be larger. It's because they leave big piles of it. So. You've got big guts. They're big animals. It's true. But when you find piles, you find lots of it. Um, how are you guys doing? Hanging in there with that coming by? Okay. Uh, I have another example of a large elongated. There's a clue in here of what it could possibly be. I wonder. What could it be? Oh. <laughs> porcupine. Yeah, so we got a porcupine that's in the elongated, small, and it's mostly wood in here. And then we have another one, the skunk. And, it, mm. and just like the, the guide says, if you get to skunk, um, which is quill. <laughs> oh, that's miscellaneous on the cylinder side. I'm just trying to confuse you because I just confused myself. But while I'm talking about this, since we're moving on to the next group, you can tell it's not a cylinder right here so much, a... but it has ants in it, exoskeletons, and that's how you know it's a skunk, is that it has a lot of um, insect parts in it. I see. Wow. Um, but the other groups that I was actually trying to get to when I was thinking about this, so the first group are the pointed ones. So the animal has the same size feet, and it also has points on its scat. So you can start putting these things together. And here's my pointed red fox and coyote. 
And the main difference is? Color. Size. Um, partially color and also size. But this isn't characteristics. The coyote could also be white. Any guesses what makes a white? Any idea. What's that? Bone. Bone, exactly. It's what they're eating. Oh, yeah. But it, and it's really characteristic that you that coyotes have a lot of fur in it because when I just saw pictures of this on Saturday, they go and they pull off all the fur and that goes into their digestive system. And they hunt along with bobcats. At the same time, they could more than one species is going at this one carcass at the same time. I know that's going oh, wow. Yeah. I didn't realize that male and female cougar have different sizes. Yeah, yeah. It's it's pretty hard to, to tell the difference between the two, but generally the male is larger than the female. That's the main character. Uh, definitely you can see fawns. They're really tiny. Mm. Then the next group, uh, the pointed are all the fox family, and then the broken ones are all are the cat family. Can I go back for a second? Then? Sure. Um, I was out west last week, and you know they like to leave their poops on roads and paths and stuff. So there was some poop that had like bone fragments in it. You bone know, was, fragments? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Like broken into pieces, like a quarter inch around. Mm -hmm. And the other one seemed to have more bird type bones in it, more small hollow bones. I was assuming that the larger one was probably coyote, and the well, smaller one was probably Well, in, in this, it, it, you can find that out right here. By looking at page 39, um, I can get to it. So you think it was a cat and not a... So the bobcat is small pieces of bone, uh -huh. and the coyote is much bigger. And this, the cat, the bobcat's going like this, <laughs> and really tearing it apart, whereas the the coyote is attacking from the front, and it has bigger pieces on it. Teeth. Does that help you with your question? No, I, I didn't think I was looking at a cat's cat. Oh, well, you might not have been, but you were definitely looking at a carnivore. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there was lots of fur, too. Yeah, I think sounds at this like point, it. They were probably both coyotes. Oh, okay. All right. There you go. You haven't gotten a coyote cat yet. Um, if we go back to, so we got the pointed and the broken, and I found these on, I found most of these on my property, actually, this one. They were all on top of each other one day, the coyote was, and then the bobcat, they all were saying, I'm, it's my territory, now it's my territory. Um, so you can see the broken pieces in it. That's how, again, how you know that it's a bobcat or a mountain lion. Um, and you can see the bone sticking out, and again, that white means it ate, it ate an animal. It ate bones. Don't they gradually whiten over time? Not really. Yeah. It's not like that. No, it's truly the bones some, um, that you see. But I understand why you think that, but it really, that would become like moldy and so, and so forth, and then it would look really different. Well, you would see that with dogs. Mm -hmm. Their scab whitens. Oh, okay. Uh huh. Uh huh. And that's just over time that the dog scat whitens? Um, they desiccate. Mm -hmm. it's, mm -hmm. Well, they, they can turn white, I should say. Uh huh. Not always, yeah. No, it might be diet. Yeah, I, usually it is. Everything that comes out. The top one's a bobcat. The then we have. Um, the top one? Yeah. The twisted oh, ones. They're both up. So you need there. No, no, turn the page again. And that's yeah. the member oh. of the twisted are all the members of the weasel family. Yeah. And this one here is the weasel, the littlest one, and this one's the fisher. So all the members of the weasel family have twisted scat. So the question is why, right? You're supposed to ask me that? Why? I don't know. <laughs> it obviously has something to do with their intestines. When I had a colonoscopy, I asked the, the doctor why he thought 
That was the game. <laughs> and so he went over and started Googling to try to figure it out. Because he didn't know. <laughs> I don't know, what can I say? <laughs> Usually I don't like how people finish that sentence, but that time I did like it. <laughs> Usually I'm like, okay, too much information. <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> we got to the blunt ones. I got you though. That one. Okay. So we have blunt and we have the bear and the raccoon. They're both blunt edges. You could you remember back to that the to the cat to the um, dog family how pointy it was. Oh, yeah. So it's really different, very rounded. And that's how you can know that you have a bear, a rounded bear. And wow. And then I showed you the skunk already because it's miscellaneous and that's whatever. And, um, and I guess that is the book. Oh. Just yeah. from start to finish. Questions? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yes, yes, please. Um, old scat, scat that's been out in the rain and the snow all winter, the dark colored matter leaches out, leaves the hair and the bones. So early in the year you find a lot of, but it'll be loose. It won't be. You know, it's losing its form, but they do turn white after, okay. after they had enough weathering. Okay, okay, But it's Good. from the leaching out of the, you know, the other material and leaving just the, just the bone and the hair. Right. Makes I them look white. Yeah, I see what you mean. Yeah. But, so those are pretty full that you would say that... Like coyote yeah. scat that have mm -hmm. been out, you know. Yeah. yeah, sure. Will change color over time. Yep. Yeah, yeah. Um, and just for the hell of it, we have a red squirrel and a gray squirrel. My, my. Tail. I don't have any other feet. So, questions? I've left you all without any questions. <coughs> I can't believe it. So, uh, if I take scat apart with my hand, I guess I'm supposed to wash it. Oh. You, you're not supposed That's to do that at all your... first. Just <laughs> take a stick. It's really not safe. So it's good to just take a stick and then take it apart. Um, I say the one that is the least, I mean, if you picked up a rabbit pellet, it, it's made out of wood. I wouldn't worry about that one. But other than that, it's just not a good idea. So I carry a plastic bag with me in my backpack, in my cruiser's vest. <clears throat> so the other thought that I had was, now I'll see if I can find this. Maybe not. Well, if you wind up uh, sending me pictures, it's great. So it's okay to do that. To the, my address is my email is on the book, but just give me some scale. So I know how big or small it is. And I have a ruler someplace here, but I don't know what I just did with it. Oh, it's on your... Oh, yeah, there's a ruler all right on there. Thank you so much. <laughs> right, you can put down the book. I never thought of saying that. If you take the picture with the book. Because now you have a pocket guy. So you can <coughs> have a it for, right? Exactly. Questions? If not, Let me that's just... it. So the books are for sale. How much are they? Oh, they're $14.95, otherwise known as $15, and I'm happy to sign them. And I have a web page, website, heartwoodpress.com, and you can get it from that site, too. Okay. Yeah. And on November 5th, Patty Smith, who does the articles for the paper, is doing one, a program specifically on the porcupines that she's been working with over the last several years. So that's November 5th right here at 7 o'clock. And... Um, she has books, too, yes. The Beavers of Papa's Pond. And on the 18th of November, maybe not as, I mean, these, are, these kinds of programs are, I was just going to say, I, I don't know, they were, 
a little more exciting, but something really important is that we have a spe specialist coming to talk with us about the, the problem that we have growing in the area. That's the hemlock woolly adelgid. And this woman is from the state, and she knows a lot about it. Margaret Skinner. Margaret Skinner, but can you say any more about the program? Um, it's going to talk about the, uh, how widespread hemlock woolly adelgid is in Dummerston and in the rest of the county, and also the experiments that they're doing with native fungus to native beetles. To, native, fungus. native fungus to attack the hemlock woolly adelgid beetle. They ha we have a, a actually a, a demonstration site um, in Dummerston up behind the um, town garage where they're actually seeing how that fungus is working on the hemlock woolly adelgid. So it's a really important that if you can let people know, get people out um, sometimes, and they have in the past, and they, I assume they will ask us again, is to go out early in, in January, February, March, and monitor to, to the trees to see how widespread it is, where it is, and, and how widespread it is. So that's the 18th of November. So that's a, so we've got those two programs coming up. And yeah, Barb. Um, you said that there's going to be people going out and monitoring. Is there a separate training thing for that, or is there a sign up at the November 18th? The, 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 if, if they want us to do that and they decide, uh, we've done it before, we have a list of people, and if you're interested in doing that kind of work, we're, we're doing, we, we need volunteers for that, and, and Betsy is our first detector person, and we've got a, a couple of other problems coming into the area, the Asian, well, we hope we don't have the Asian longhorn beetle. We have to watch for it because that one well, we really have to be on top of immediately because that can be eradicated, but the sooner we get on top of it, the better. We hope it's not here. And then we've got the emerald ash borer that's on its way here. And they have jobs for us to do. One of the jobs we already did about the emerald ash borer is that Betsy and Lynn drove around town to find all of the ash trees. We assume that the ash trees are all going to be dying and that the town needs to know where they are because we don't want trees just falling across the road. And so the town, wants, if, the, if the emerald ash borer is here, then they'll take out those trees. The town has to be prepared too because that's going to be a big expense, so they have to be ready for that. So there's lots of natural resources related issues that we, that are really hard. It's hard to hard. Time. So, B Betsy, tell us the best story to end on the upbeat. What's the yes. best thing that we said in terms of an insect? Oh, tell us about oh. those. Oh, tell us. <laughs> yes. Oh, oh, yeah. Oh, tell us about these things that um, you guys saw. All right. So, Lynn and I were um, in the woods the other day, and all of a sudden, we saw a tree that we thought was covered in snow. We both stopped and looked at it. We had no idea what it was, and as we approached the tree, all the snow started to move. And it turns out it's an aphid that lands on beech trees, and it's called the boogie woogie aphid. <laughs> and as a, as a, to protect <laughs> itself this from- This is true. This from is true. true. This is really true. When it feels like something's threatening it, all of the aphids <laughs> start to wave their butts in the air. And it looks like they're dancing. So you can get, you can walk up to the tree, and then you can move back and it settles down. It looks like little tiny white film on the tree. You can Google it, the boogie woogie aphid. And then there's actually YouTube videos of the aphids put to music. So. <laughs> <laughs> And we have had other, native. other native. sightings in town, well, but this is this, these are these are not dangerous. They're not. I mean, they're oh no, not no, no. This as far as we no, no. Really I've done some research on it. It's, yeah. it's not a big. Problem they only at all. attract. They only are on beech trees, and they tend to be in a small area. Right. And both of these, where we saw them, are very close together. Right. I think they attract them. teachers. Foresters. <laughs> Lynn was not being quiet when we saw those things. I'm sorry I can't repeat what she said. But she was far from quiet. So That's pretty crazy. crazy. We do have a website, the DummersonConservation.com. If you see something like that, let us know. There's a place there where you can let us know. And also, if you can send pictures, that's great. 
We also have a blog where you can send pictures and write stuff, and you can access that through our website. So you should know about our, our website. So here's, if you want to go on one of my walks and let know, I'll put this right here. And I guess that's it. Thanks for coming, and thanks to Anne. Thanks to Ann Richards for doing the I know that this is going out way beyond our group tonight. It's on BCTV, and then people all over this area will be able to see it. People can download it from a website even anytime. You don't have to watch it just when it's showing, and it gets sent around the state so it gets showed statewide on community television.